A lecture given here about more complex questions of reincarnation will have allowed you to see that initial elementary truths of spiritual science are modified as we gradually rise to insight into ever higher worlds. It is nevertheless right to represent general universal truths in as elementary and simple a way as possible at the beginning. But at the same time, we need gradually to leave our ABC primers behind us and work our way through to higher truths. You see, these higher truths are what gradually enable us to accomplish something that is part of spiritual science's intended gift to us, the capacity to understand and penetrate the world that surrounds us in the sensory physical domain. There is, of course, a long way still to go in this ascending journey before we succeed in drawing the lines and forces underlying the world of the senses into an overall context of some kind. Yet many things that have been said in recent sessions will have helped one or another aspect of our existence to become clearer and more explicable. Today we will try to go a little further and again speak of more complex questions of reincarnation. To do so, we need to clarify, above all, that beings who hold a leading position in the evolution of humanity on earth differ from one another. In the course of our earthly evolution, we must distinguish leading individualities who have, one can say, evolved with the humanity of our earth from the beginning albeit advancing more quickly than us. We could put it like this. If we look back to our long, distant Lemurian past, we find the most varied degrees of evolution amongst the human beings incarnated at that time. All the souls incarnated, embodied at that time, passed through repeated incarnations throughout the subsequent Atlantean period and then our post-Atlantean era. Souls evolved at different speeds, and here we find those who evolved relatively slowly through different incarnations, and will still need to pass through long, long evolutionary journeys in future. There are also, though, other souls who evolved rapidly and who, you can say, used their incarnations more productively, and therefore stand today stand at a level of soul spiritual and thus spiritual development so advanced that an ordinary modern person will only achieve it in the very far distant future. But staying in this sphere of souls, we can say that however advanced such souls may be, however lofty they may be compared to ordinary people, they underwent the same earthly evolution as others and simply advanced more quickly. Apart from these leading individualities, who are kindred with other human beings but just stand at a higher level, there are other individualities, other beings, who as humanity evolved certainly did not pass through different incarnations as the others did. We can roughly illustrate what underlies this if we consider that in the Lemurian times we have been studying, beings existed who no longer needed to descend so deeply into physical embodiment as other human beings, as all the beings that have been described. These were, therefore, beings who could have pursued their evolution into higher, more spiritual regions, and whose own further progress did not necessitate them descending into bodies of flesh. But a being of this kind can nevertheless intervene in the course of human evolution by, as it were, vicariously descending into a body of the kind human beings have. Thus at some point or other a being, an entity, can appear. And if we study such a being's soul clairvoyantly, we can establish that it is not one who can be traced back in time as others can that we cannot find a succession of previous physical incarnations. 
In tracing the soul back through time, we may not find any former bodily incarnation whatsoever. If we do discover a physical embodiment, then it is basically only because such beings can also frequently descend and incarnate vicariously in a human body. A spiritual being of this kind, one therefore who descends into a human body in order to intervene in evolution as a human being, gains no advantage from this incarnation, finds no personal meaning in experiences acquired here in the world. In the Eastern tradition, such a being is called an avatar, in quotes. And that is the difference between a leading being emerging from human evolution as such and one called an avatar, that the latter draws no fruits from the physical incarnations or incarnation which he undergoes, since he enters a physical body for the purpose of bringing salvation and progress to human beings. To sum up, such an avatar can enter a human body on one or more occasions, yet will be decidedly different from any other human individuality. As you will gather from the spirit of all the lectures given here, the greatest avatar being who has lived on earth is Christ, the being we designate as Christ, who took possession of the body of Jesus of Nazareth when the latter was thirty years of age. This being who first came into contact with our earth two millennia ago was incarnated in a body of flesh for three years. Since then he has been bound up with the astral sphere, thus with the spiritual sphere of our supersensible world. This avatar being is of wholly unique significance. We would seek the Christ being in a former human incarnation on earth in vain, although other lower avatars can incarnate frequently. The difference does not lie in fact that they incar incarnate often, but that they draw no benefit for themselves from their earthly embodiments. Human beings give nothing to the world, but only take from it, while these beings only give and take nothing from the earth. But if you wish properly to understand these things, you will need to distinguish between an avatar as lofty as Christ was and lower avatar beings. Such avatar beings can have the most varied missions on our earth, we can outline the kinds of mission they have, and to avoid skirting round the theme in a speculative way, let us immediately take a specific instance and illustrate the possible nature of such a task. You all know from the group of tales surrounding Noah that ancient Hebrew texts assign a large portion of post-Atlantean, post-Noah humanity to three progenitors. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Today we are not going to enter further into what Noah and these three progenitors can tell us in a different context. We will just clarify the fact that Hebrew texts which refer to Shem, one of Noah's sons, see Shem as progenitor of the whole Semitic line. A truly esoteric view of such matters, of such a tale, will discover the deeper truths underlying it. Those capable of studying such matters esoterically know the following about Shem, this progenitor of the Semitic race. From birth onward, indeed even earlier, measures must be taken to ensure that such an individual destined to be the progenitor of a whole line of descent can actually fulfill this mission. What are these measures ensuring that Shem, in this example, can become the progenitor of a whole people or race? In Shem's case, this occurred by means of him receiving, you can say, a very specially prepared ether body. When we are born, as you know, our ether or life body is incorporated around our individuality, alongside the other aspects of our human nature. For the ancestor of a whole race, a special ether body must be prepared and will act as pattern and archetype for the ether bodies of all future descendants of this individual in further generations. 
Such a progenitor, therefore, will have a typical ether body, a kind of matrix ether body. And then, through blood kinship, this is passed on through the generations, so that, in a sense, the ether bodies of all descendants belonging to the same line are reflections of the ancestor's ether body. All the ether bodies of the Semitic race, therefore, were interwoven with something like an image of Shem's ether body. How does such a thing occur during the course of human evolution? If we take a closer look at this figure of Shem, we find that his ether body retained its archetypal form by virtue of the fact that an avatar wove himself into it. While not as lofty in nature as some others, this was nevertheless a high avatar being who descended into Shem's ether body. The avatar did not connect with either the astral body or the eye of Shem, only, as it were, interweaving with his ether body. In this example we can already study the significance of an avatar participating in the human form and constitution. What is the overall meaning and purpose of a person such as Shem, whose mission is to be the progenitor of the whole race? having an avatar interwoven with his body. The significance of this is that each time an avatar is woven into a human being of flesh and blood, some aspect or several aspects of this human being can multiply and replicate, can be split into numerous parts. By virtue of the fact that an avatar was interwoven with Shem's ether body, It was possible for numerous copies of the original to arise, so that these countless copies could be woven into all those who descended from the progenitor over many generations. Thus, the significance of an avatar's descent is, among other things, that it allows replication of one or several aspects of the being ensouled by the avatar. Countless copies of the original arise, all formed in its image. As you can gather, an especially valuable ether body was present in Shem, an archetypal ether body, prepared and then woven into Shem by a high avatar, so that it could descend in many replicated copies to all those who were to be related by blood to this ancestor. In the lecture I referred to at the start, We also spoke of the fact that a spiritual economy exists of a kind that preserves something of particular value and carries it on into the future. We have heard that the astral body and ether body can reincarnate as well as the eye. Apart from the fact that countless copies of Shem's ether body arose, his own ether body was preserved in the spiritual world since it was of very great use in the, latter, in the later mission of the Hebrew people. All the distinctive characteristics of the Hebrew people had originally come to expression in this ether body. If something of very special importance should occur for the ancient Hebrew people, say the entrusting of a special mission or task, this could best be undertaken by an individual who bore within him this ether body of the progenitor. This is indeed what occurred. An individuality who was later to intervene in the history of the Hebrew people bore the progenitor's ether body in him. Indeed, we have here one of those wonderful complications in human humanity's evolution that can be so illuminating. A very high individuality. He had, as it were, to stoop down to the Hebrew people so as to be able to speak to them in a way they could understand and give them the power to undertake a special mission. This was somewhat like a person of outstanding intellectual capacities learning the language of an untutored tribe in order to be able to communicate with them. He will not necessarily gain much himself by learning this language, but must adapt his thoughts to express them by this means, must make himself at home in this language. In a similar way, a high individuality had to adapt to and make himself at home in Shem's ether body in order to be able to bring a very specific impulse 
to the ancient Hebrew people. This is the figure named Melchizedek in biblical history. He clothed himself in Shem's ether body, as it were, to give Abraham the impulse that you will find described in the Bible. Thus, apart from what was contained in Shem's individuality, multiplying by virtue of an avatar incarnated in him, and then being woven into all the other ether bodies of members of the Hebrew people, Shem's own ether body was preserved in the spiritual world, so that Melchizedek could later wear it and thus pass on an important impulse to the Hebrew people via Abraham. So finely woven are the realities underlying the physical world, and only through these we can understand what occurs in the physical world. We can only gain insight into history by grasping realities of a spiritual nature underlying physical realities. If we remain with merely physical realities, history, simply on its own terms, can never be understood. What has been outlined here, the descent of an avatar leading to replication of the supersensible bodies of the one who bears this avatar within him, and the passing on to others of these copies of the archetype, is of very particular importance when we come to Christ's appearance on earth. By virtue of the fact that the avatar being of Christ dwelt in the body of Jesus of Nazareth, it became possible for both Jesus' ether body and astral body to be multiplied countless times. Even the eye as well could be reproduced as an impulse kindled in the astral body when the Christ entered the threefold aspects of Jesus of Nazareth. Initially, though, we will consider how the avatar multiplied Jesus of Nazareth's ether body and astral body. One of the most incisive moments in humanity's history occurs when the Christ principle appears within earth evolution. What I have told you about Shem is basically typical and characteristic of the pre-Christian era. When an ether body or also an astral body is replicated in this way, its copies usually pass to those who are related by blood to the progenitor possessing its archetype. Thus copies of Shem's ether body were passed on to members of the Hebrew people. This changed when the Christ avatar appeared. The ether body and astral body of Jesus of Nazareth were multiplied, and these replicated copies were preserved until such time as they could be used in the course of humanity's evolution. But they were not tied to one or another nationality, tribe, or race. Instead, in subsequent times, whenever a person appeared who was mature enough, who, irrespective of his nationality, was suited to receive a copy of Jesus of Nazareth's astral or etheric body, then this could happen. And these copies were woven into his own astral or ether body. We see the potential, therefore, for all kinds of people to have woven into them copies like imprints of Jesus of Nazareth's astral or ether body. The intimate history of Christian evolution is connected with this fact. What is normally presented as Christian history is a sum of only external processes. And much too little attention is given, therefore, to the most important aspect, the distinguishing of real periods in Christian development. Those able to gain deeper insight into the evolution of Christianity will easily discover that the way in which Christianity was disseminated in the first Christian centuries was quite different from later centuries. In the earlier Christian period, the spread of Christianity was bound up with everything that could be acquired from the physical plane. We need only survey the early Christian teachers to find accentuation of physical memories, physical circumstances, and everything physical that had been preserved. You need only recall that Irenaeus, who made a major contribution to the spread of Christianity in different countries in the first century A.D., placed great emphasis on the fact 
that in living memory people had witnessed the apostles' pupils at first hand. Great importance was placed on being able to authenticate physical memories such as that Christ himself had taught in Palestine, that Papias had himself sat at the feet of the apostles was a matter of great importance. Even the dwelling places of those who had been eyewitnesses of Christ and Palestine were identified and described. Thus memory of these physical narratives was especially stressed in the first Christian centuries. The extent to which all remaining physical evidence is accentuated can be seen in the words of Augustine of Hippo, who lived at the end of this period, and stated, quote, Why do I believe in the truths of Christianity? Because the authority of the Catholic Church compels me to. Close quote. For him, the key thing is the physical authority of something existing in the physical world the corporeal reality in the linking of one person to another that can be followed back to someone like Peter as a companion of Christ. This is the decisive thing for him. So we can see that great worth is assigned to documents, to impressions, gained from the physical plane in the first centuries of the spread of Christianity. After Augustine's time, through to around the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries, things change in this respect. It is no longer possible to rely on living memory and only to cite physical evidence, since this lies in a past that is now too long gone. In the whole mood and outlook, too, of those who profess Christianity, and this is particularly true of people in Europe, something quite different is present. At this time, something like direct knowledge of Christ's existence prevails a knowledge that Christ died on the cross and lives on. Between the 4th and 5th centuries and the 10th to 12th centuries, a great number of people would have considered it very misguided indeed to cast any doubt on the events in Palestine, for they knew better. Such people lived throughout Europe especially. They were always able to have something like a small-scale inner Pauline revelation an experience of what Paul, who had previously been Saul, underwent on the road to Damascus, which transformed him into Paul. What was it that enabled a number of people to receive something resembling clairvoyant revelations about the events of Palestine? This was possible because in these centuries the preserved copies or imprints of the replicated ether body of Jesus of Nazareth were woven into a large number of people. You can say that they were permitted to clothe themselves with these copies. Their ether body was not composed entirely of this image of Jesus' ether body, but woven into their ether body was an image of the original that stemmed from Jesus of Nazareth. During these centuries, there were people with the capacity to possess such an ether body, enabling them to have direct knowledge of Jesus of Nazareth and also of Christ. But this also meant that the image of Christ was released from external, historical, physically conveyed tradition. It appears in a form most liberated from this tradition in the wonderful poem of the ninth century known as the Heliant poem, originating in the time of Louis the Pious, who ruled from 814 to 840. An outwardly plain and simple man in Saxony recorded it in writing. His astral body and eye were far from equal to what his ether body contained, for this was interwoven with an image of Jesus of Nazareth's ether body. This humble Saxon pastor who wrote the poem down knew from direct clairvoyant perception, with great certainty, that Christ is present on the astral plane and is the same who was crucified at Golgotha. And because he had direct and certain knowledge of this, he no longer needed to refer to historical documents. He no longer needed physical evidence that Christ had been there. He therefore describes him in a form emancipated from the whole setting of Palestine, released from the distinctive nature of Judaism. 
He describes him roughly as the lord of a central European or Germanic tribe, and his adherents, the apostles around him, as the thanes of a Germanic prince. All external scenes have been changed, retaining only the core, the eternal nature of the figure of Christ and the structure of events. Having this kind of direct knowledge, founded on something as imminent as an imprint of Jesus of Nazareth's ether body, this author did not have to lean upon actual historical events in speaking of Christ. Instead, he dressed his direct knowledge in the garb of different outward surroundings. We find in this author of the Heliant poem one of the remarkable individuals we described as possessing an ether body into which an imprint of Jesus of Nazareth's ether body was woven. And likewise, we could find other such individuals at this period. Thus we see how something of the very greatest importance occurs behind physical events and can offer us an intimate understanding of history. Tracing Christian development further, we then come to the 11th and 12th centuries through to the 15th. Here a quite different secret came into its own and carried the whole development further. Initially there was the memory of what occurred on the physical plane, then the etheric element wove itself directly into the ether bodies of Christianity's leading lights in Central Europe. In subsequent centuries, from the 12th to the 15th century, the astral body of Jesus of Nazareth came to be woven in numerous images into the astral bodies of key sustainers of Christianity. Such people had an eye that was capable of conceiving very mistaken ideas about all sorts of things, yet in their astral bodies lived an immediacy of power and devotion and direct certainty of sacred truths. Such people possessed deep fervor, utter conviction, and in some circumstances the capacity to substantiate this conviction. What can strike us sometimes as so strange in these individuals is the fact that their eye was not equal to what their astral body contained, since the latter was interwoven with an imprint of the astral body of Jesus of Nazareth. The actions of their eye sometimes seemed grotesque, contrasted with the majesty and lofty nature of the world of their feelings and moods, their religious fervor. Francis of Assisi was one such individual. While we must have the deepest possible veneration for his whole world of feeling, for everything he did, the perspective outlined here can help us to understand things about his conscious eye that seem incomprehensible to us today. He was one of those into whom was woven an imprint of the astral body of Jesus of Nazareth, and thus he was capable of accomplishing what he did. Numerous adherents of his in the Franciscan order, with its servant Franciscans and Minorites, likewise had similar imprints woven into their astral bodies. If you dwell properly, inwardly, on this world evolutionary transition between past and future, then all the remarkable and otherwise strange and mysterious phenomena of those times can dawn clearly and brightly before you. We have to discern whether woven into the astral bodies of these people of the Middle Ages, was more of what we call the sentient soul, or of the mind soul, or of the consciousness soul. The human astral body, you see, must in a sense be regarded as enclosing the I within it. Francis of Assisi was entirely imbued with what we can call the sentient soul of Jesus of Nazareth, and we can likewise experience the biographical trajectory of another wonderful personality in the most soulful way, if we know the secret contained in her life, Elizabeth of Thuringia, born 1207, was someone whose sentient soul was inwoven with an image of the astral body of Jesus of Nazareth. Knowing such a thing can resolve the riddle presented by such a figure. And one particular phenomenon will become clear to you above all 
If you know that during this period the sentient soul, mind soul or consciousness soul as imprints of the astral body of Jesus of Nazareth were woven into many diverse individuals. The phenomenon I refer to is the discipline commonly called scholasticism, something little understood today but much maligned. What task did scholasticism set itself? It sought to draw on capacities of judgment and discernment, on the intellect, to find proofs and evidence for things for which neither a physical, historical basis existed, nor which could any longer be perceived as direct clairvoyant certainties, as had been possible in previous incarnations through the inwoven ether body of Jesus of Nazareth. The scholastics set themselves a task based on the following insights, that tradition told them of the historical appearance of Christ Jesus, of the intervention in humanity's evolution of other spiritual beings of whom religious texts testify, drawing on their rational or mind-soul on the intellectual aspect of the imprint of Jesus of Nazareth's astral body, they set themselves the task of proving through subtle concepts that were clearly delineated and elaborated all the mystery truths contained in their texts. Thus arose this remarkable discipline, an attempt to achieve acuity and intellectual prowess in a way probably unsurpassed in humanity's history. Over the course of several centuries, however you regard the contents of scholastic thinking, let me read that again, over the course of several centuries, however you regard the contents of scholastic thinking, the faculty of human reflection was nurtured and came to inform the whole culture of the age simply by virtue of the fact that concepts were defined, shaped, and distinguished in an extraordinarily subtle way. In the period between the 13th and 15th centuries, scholasticism imprinted into humanity the faculty of thinking in acute and penetratingly logical ways. In those informed more by the consciousness soul, or rather the manifesting imprint of the consciousness soul of Jesus of Nazareth, there appeared, since the I has its seat in the consciousness soul, the special insight that Christ can be found in the I capital. And since they themselves possessed the element of the consciousness soul from the astral body of Jesus of Nazareth, the inner Christ dawned in their inner life. Through this astral body, they perceived that the Christ within them was the Christ himself, Meister Eckhart, Johannes Tauler, and all the key figures of medieval mysticism were of this kind. You can see, therefore, how all successive phases of the astral body were replicated through the high avatar Christ entering the body of Jesus of Nazareth, and how they worked on in the subsequent period to bring about the actual development of Christianity. But there is yet another important transition. We see that humanity's development is also otherwise reliant on receiving and incorporating these aspects of the being of Jesus of Nazareth. In the first Christian centuries lived people wholly reliant on the physical plane, then came people in subsequent centuries who were predisposed to receive, woven into them, the element of Jesus of Nazareth's ether body. Later, we can say that people were more oriented to the astral body. And it now also became possible for the imprint of Jesus of Nazareth's astral body to be incorporated into them. The astral body is the bearer of the power of judgment, which awoke most especially between the 12th and the 14th centuries. You can gather this from yet another phenomenon as well. Until this time it was quite clear to people how deep were the mysteries surrounding the Last Supper. All that lay in the words, quote, This is my body and this is my blood, close quote, was accepted, at the most only debated in very small circles, as felt experience because in these words Christ pointed 
to the fact that he will be united with the earth, with its planetary spirit. And since flour is the most precious substance derived from the physical earth, it became the body of Christ for people. And the sap that rises through plants, through the vine, came to contain something of the blood of Christ for them. This knowledge did not diminish the value of the Last Supper, but on the contrary increased it. During these centuries, people felt themselves, excuse me, people felt something of these endless depths until the power of judgment awoke in the astral body. It is then that doubt also first arises. And from then on, disputation about the Last Supper developed. Just consider the debates that went on among the Hussites in the Lutheran faith and its factions under Tsingli and Calvin about what the real nature of the Last Supper might be. Such debates would not have been possible formerly, since people still retained direct knowledge of the Last Supper. But here we see demonstration of a great law of history, which is of particular importance for spiritual science. As long as people knew what the Last Supper was, they did not debate it. Only when they lost this direct understanding of the Last Supper did they enter into a prolonged debate about it. You can take this as generally indicative of the fact that we do not really know the truth about something if we start discussing and debating it. Where knowledge exists, it is communicated, and really there will be little desire to debate it. Where desire for debate arises, there is usually no knowledge of the truth. Debate and dissent starts from lack of knowledge and is invariably a sign of decline in understanding the serious core of a matter. A movement or cultural stream heads toward dissolution whenever debates commence. It is very important to repeatedly grasp the fact in the domain of spiritual science that the desire for debate can be regarded as a sign of lack of knowledge. By contrast, we should cultivate the opposite of debate, which is the will to learn, the will gradually to gain insight into what is involved. Here we see a great historical fact, verified in the development of Christianity itself. But we can learn something else if we see how the faculty of judgment, this acute intellectual wisdom, rooted in the astral body, develops during these centuries of Christianity. We must consider realities, not dogmas, however, if we are to learn of all that Christianity progressively achieved. If we disregard the content of scholasticism but focus on it as education and cultivation of capacities, we can ask what it later became. Do you know what it led to? Modern science. Modern science is inconceivable without the reality of this field of Christian scholarship in the medieval period. It is not just that Copernicus was a canon and Giordano Bruno a Dominican, but that all the forms of thought which people used when getting to grips with the natural world from the 15th and 16th centuries onward are nothing other than what was cultivated and nurtured between the 11th and 16th centuries in medieval Christian scholarship. It is at odds with reality, is living in abstractions, to open scholastic texts, compare them with those of modern science, and conclude that Haeckel et al. see things quite differently. We are concerned with realities here. Haeckel, Darwin, Dubois, Raymond, Huxley, and others could never have written what they did without the precedence of medieval Christian scholarship. They owe the fact that they can think as they do to this scholarship, to scholasticism. That is the reality. Through this schooling, humanity learned to think in the true sense of the word. We can pursue this further still. Read David Friedrich Strauss and try to reflect on his mode of thinking. Try to be clear about his forms and configurations of thought, how he seeks to present the whole life of Jesus of Nazareth as a myth. Do you know where he gets his acuity of thinking? From medieval Christian scholarship. Everything used today to join such fierce battle with Christianity has been learned from medieval Christian scholarship. In fact, it is true to say 
that no opponent of Christianity today of Christianity today could think as he does, and that therefore no such opponents could exist if he had not learned such forms of thought from medieval Christian scholarship. A realistic appraisal of world history is, however, required to acknowledge this. And what has actually happened since the 16th century? The I itself has increasingly come to the fore, and with it human egotism and in turn materialism. People have unlearned and forgotten all the content the eye absorbed, and have therefore inevitably restricted themselves to what the eye can observe, what the sensory apparatus can give to ordinary rationality. Only this has it been able to take with it into the human being's inner dwelling. The culture of egotism distinguishes post-16th century civilization, But what needs to enter this I now? Christianity underwent development in the external physical body, in the ether body, in the astral body, and worked its way up as far as the I. Within this I, it must now absorb the mysteries and secrets of Christianity itself. After this I has learned to think for a while through Christianity, and has applied its thoughts to the external world. It must now become possible to make the eye into an organ receptive to Christ. The eye must again discover the wisdom that is the primal wisdom of the great avatar of Christ himself. And how must this come about? Through a spiritual scientific deepening of Christianity. Carefully prepared through the three stages of physical, etheric, and astral development, it is now important for the organ to open within the human being that enables him to look into spiritual, into his spiritual environment, the I, E-Y-E, that Christ can open for him. Christ descended to the earth as the greatest avatar being. Let us attune to a perspective that seeks to regard the world as it can be regarded once we have taken Christ into ourselves. Then we will find our whole world evolutionary path to be incandescent with the Christ being, pervaded by him. In other words, we can describe how the human physical body first developed gradually on old Saturn and was joined by the ether body on old Sun, by the astral body on old moon, and how the I entered us on earth. And then we will find that all this seeks the goal of an ever-increasing autonomy and individualization, so that we can incorporate into earthly evolution the wisdom that streams from the sun to the earth. Christ and Christianity must, in a sense, become the focal point of the emancipated I capital of modern times the center of its perspective on the world. And so you can see how Christianity gradually prepared the way for what it was to become. In its first centuries, Christians absorbed it with their physical cognitive capacities, then later with their etheric faculties, and through the medieval period with their astral faculties of cognition. After this, the true form of Christianity was suppressed for a while until the three bodies had schooled the eye during the post-Christian development. But, having learned to think and direct its gaze outward into the objective world, this eye is now also ready to perceive in this objective world, in all phenomena, the spiritual realities so intimately bound up with the central being, the being of Christ, and to see Christ everywhere as the underlying foundation in the most diverse manifold forms. We thus arrive at the starting point of spiritual scientific understanding of and insight into Christianity, and can discern the task, the mission assigned to this movement for spiritual insight. At the same time, we can recognize the reality of this mission, Just as each person has a physical, etheric, and astral body and I, and gradually ascends to ever greater heights, the same holds true of Christianity's historical development. 
We can say that Christianity likewise has a physical body, ether body, astral body, and I, one capable even as in our own times of denying its own origin and wellspring. We can see how egotistic the I can become generally, while at the same time retaining the capacity to also take up the true being of Christ within it and ascend to ever higher levels of existence. The human being as a single individual corresponds to the wider world, both in terms of the latter's integral wholeness and the course of its historical development. By looking at things in this way, from a spiritual scientific perspective, a broad panorama of the future opens before us, and we find that this can engage our hearts and fill them with enthusiasm. Increasingly we come to understand what we must do, knowing also that we are not just feeling our way blindly. Our approach, you see, has not been to concoct ideas and try arbitrarily to project them upon the future, but instead to reach for and pursue the ideas which have slowly and gradually been prepared through centuries of Christian evolution. Just as the I must first appear, and can only gradually evolve towards spirit self, life spirit, and spirit man, upon the preceding foundation of physical body, ether body, and astral body. So modern human beings, with their eye configuration, with their modern thinking, have only been able to evolve from the astral, etheric, and physical forms of Christianity. Christianity has become I. Just as real as this course of preceding evolution is the fact that humanity's I form, its I configuration, can only become apparent once the astral and etheric configurations of Christianity have evolved. In future Christianity will evolve further and will come to offer us quite different things so that Christian evolution and Christian ways of life will arise in a new form. The transformed astral body will manifest as the Christian spirit self and the transformed ether body as the Christian life spirit. And in a luminous future perspective of Christianity, the star of spirit man, toward which our lives slowly work their way, rises and shines before our souls as a radiant light, as the luminous spirit of Christianity.